come, <laughs> may, may listen to this. There will be a quiz between now and the end of the term. And it's going to be a surprise quiz in the sense I will tell you ahead of time when it's going to be. But the material I will tell you, it is going to be on functional approximation and everything that we have seen since the midterm, the second midterm. And the second midterm, I still haven't finished marking, I've started it's, a, I guess, a longer exam, so it's taking me also a longer time. I apologize for that. Um, hopefully by Thursday I should be done. Before your break, you should know uh, where you are uh, in the class. I will put, put the updated uh, list as well. The other thing I want to kind of uh, make a mention is the breakdown that I have shown are just guides at this stage, okay? The way that I have grouped people as above average, one standard deviation, above average, below average, and one standard deviation, below average, etc. It's to get, kind of give you where you are in the class. It's not going to translate directly into grade of A, B, C, D, okay? Um, because I would use my discretion in determining where the breakpoints are. So it is curved, but the, the transition between A and B and B and C, etc. Uh, will be to the benefit of you in some sense. Um, because I'm, I'm not happy about just giving two or three A's in this course. I, I would expect at least 15 to 20 percent in the range of the class will get an A, something like that. Okay, so you shouldn't be overly concerned if you are on the border of any border between A and B or B and C. Um, but if you are at the bottom of that rank, then you have an uphill battle to go to the next level. Okay, so you can get some sense of where you are from that uh, point of view. Okay, so. If there are no questions, let, let me uh, continue with uh, functional approximations. Okay, so far we have learned how to represent a set of data points by a function, polynomial curve fitting. So the key uh, part of uh, that portion is to convert that uh, polynomial representation or in terms of any basis functions into a problem involving system of linear equations. And if the unknown coefficients in your function appear non-linearly, then you have a non-linear curve fitting. But if they appear linearly, like a polynomial is always linear in coefficients. You have a1 plus a2x plus 3 a3x squared. x squared is a non-linear function, but x is known, okay? So you're just looking at a1, a2, a3. Those are all appearing linearly, as not as a product. So that will be a linear curve fitting, okay? So least squares gives rise to a linear curve fitting. But we also saw an example of the Antoine equation, vapor pressure versus temperature data, where you have log of A plus B over T, things like that. So then you have a nonlinear curve fitting. And the tool, the MATLAB tool that allows you to do that in an effortless way, even though it involves a fairly sophisticated theory underlying it, is the CF2, curve fitting toolbox, okay? Uh, and then we moved on to, in the last lecture, doing a curve fitting without having to solve a set of linear algebraic equations in the case of a polynomial. So we still end up with polynomial curve fitting, but it applies only to data that are uniformly spaced, okay? So the uniform spacing H is given, all the data are equally spaced, and then the relationship between X and alpha is X is equal to X1 plus alpha H. So we have two independent variables. We're making the transformation from x to alpha. x1 is the reference point, h is the step size in the independent variable. And you're given a set of functions and we saw how to construct two kinds of polynomials in the last lecture by developing the theory behind it in terms of the operator algebra. The first one is called the Newton forward formula and the other one is called the Newton backward formula. Now the Newton forward formula uses the forward difference operators. So these are called forward difference operators, okay? So they are all operating on a certain quantity and that quantity is here. So an operator is a rule. So when I write, for example, delta F, you should understand the meaning of that. You have defined what that is. So delta F, delta square F, one, etc. okay? And we in fact saw how to construct the difference table in the last lecture and represent polynomials of varying degrees of approximation by simply truncating the series at different positions. And we end up with a truncation error. So the meaning of this particular equation is that m minus 1 here 
stands for the degree of the polynomial approximation to the function. And so you will have terms up to of order m minus 1. And then the truncation error, the neglected term in the series is of order h to the power m. Okay. And similarly, we took the Newton backward formula. We said we'll construct a polynomial of degree n. So the term, the last term that is in the polynomial is delta to the power, delta n operating on f of x0. And so the truncation error is of order h n plus 1, one higher than the degree of the polynomial. That you should be able to interpret. This formula will be there in a formula sheet in the final exam. Okay, But you should be able to interpret it and do calculations with it when I say truncated to a second degree or third degree, etc. Okay. Now we are going to use that polynomial representation to construct what are called derivatives, numerical differentiation. Okay. So this topic simply means if you give me a set of functions and if I have to take the derivative of that function only from the tabular data, how can I do that? Okay. So geometrically what that means is you have this function f, x and you have a set of data points like this, equally spaced. Okay. So we know how to construct a polynomial that passes through this. Those are the Newton forward polynomial and backward polynomials for the data points that are given at equally spaced location. Okay. Now the question that we are asking is, how do we calculate the slope of this function, for example, at this point? What is the slope? At any point, you should be able to calculate this at any point. And the next question that we will answer after we finish this is, what is the area under the curve? between two points A and B. That will be called numerical integration. Okay, So you're just given a tabular set of data. We want to develop a formula and we plug in the numbers from the table and that should represent first the function which is coming from Newton forward and backward formula. Second, it's derivative at any location which is what, what we're going to do now and then the integral area under the curve. Okay, And once we learn these things, we will they themselves will be useful in um, looking at a number of problems in reaction engineering and fluid mechanics, etc. later on. But this will also form the basis for solving differential equations, which will be the next step that we are going to take. Okay, So let's begin the process. So we are going to start with the Newton forward polynomial. Okay, So up to of degree m minus 1. So the polynomial is of degree m minus 1. What is the reference point? x1. So how do you tell the reference point? You look at this position and you look at where the function is calculated. x1, f1. That is my reference point. From there I'm constructing using data points ahead of it. So this is why it's called a Newton forward po polynomial. Okay. And what is the variable? The new variable It's not x anymore. It is alpha. So the, these are the variables. So the, it is a polynomial in alpha containing degrees of alpha, alpha, alpha squared, alpha cube, etc. But it is constructed in such a nice way that the higher order terms will automatically drop out if you want to calculate the points only at those locations where you have fitted it. So the polynomial should pass through those data points. At any other point, it's either interpolation or extrapolation. Okay. So this polynomial passes through this set of data points, xi, fi, all the m data points that are given to us. And it has a truncation error of order h to the power m. You should be able, able to explain these concepts. So what is a truncation error? And what is the truncation error in a given formula? You should be able to deduce that. Okay. So my goal now is to calculate what is df dx at any position. Okay, that's my goal. And so I realize that f has been replaced by p, the polynomial, by this approximation. And x has been replaced by alpha. So if I want to calculate d of dx, that actually means I need to approximate that by d p m minus 1 dx in the first place because f has been replaced by f is only a tabular data. Okay, so that has been replaced by the polynomial. And x has been replaced by alpha. So I need to actually replace this by this is what I'm showing you here. df dx is approximated by d p m minus 1 dx. But x has been replaced by alpha, so I apply the chain rule. So dpm d alpha times d alpha dx. Okay. But I know the relationship between alpha and x, which I already have indicated to you here. So from this, if I take the derivative with respect to alpha, dx with respect to d alpha, x1 is a constant. So its derivative is 0. And then h times d alpha. So dx d alpha is equal to h or d alpha dx 
the inverse is equal to 1 over h, which is what I need here. Okay, so that's fa fairly simple, straightforward calculus, but the task is now for us to take the derivative of the polynomial with respect to alpha. So d alpha dx, let me write this here as 1 over h. Okay, that is the part that you see here. d alpha dx is this. Now I'm going to focus on getting these derivatives in detail. Okay, so how do I do that? So I take term by term its derivative with respect to alpha. So what is the derivative? Remember, when the square bracket operates on f of x1, what does it actually mean? It means f1 is operating on 1. So that's why we simply f1. Then f1 is operating on delta. So it will be delta f1. That's the square f1, etc. So the terms in square brackets are operators. And it is all of them are operating on f1. Okay, is that concept clear? Okay, so I'm going to take the derivative of 1 with respect to alpha. What would that be? 0, because it's a constant, right? So the first term here is going to be 0, plus the next one is going to be derivative of alpha with respect to alpha, which is going to be 1. Okay, so I will have what is left is just delta. And it is operating on f1. So I'll take the operation inside. Okay. Plus, what would be the next one? The next one I need to apply the chain rule because I have a product alpha times alpha minus 1. I need to take the derivative of that. But it is del square over 2 factorial f. So this is going to be written as the by applying the chain rule. Okay. First, I'm going to write it as alpha plus second alpha minus 1 divided by 2 factorial delta square f1. Okay, So this comes by simply splitting the derivative into two parts. First I'm taking that keeping alpha constant, taking derivative with respect to alpha minus 1, which is 1. Then I'm keeping alpha minus 1 constant, taking the derivative with respect to alpha, which is also 1. So it splits into alpha plus alpha minus 1. This is going to be even more difficult. Okay, So what would that be? alpha times alpha minus 1 times the derivative of alpha minus 2, which is 1, plus uh, alpha minus 1 times alpha minus 2 times the derivative of alpha, which is 1, plus, what would that be? Alpha times alpha minus 2 times the derivative of alpha minus 1, which will be 1, okay, divided by 3 factorial operating on del cube f1 plus just goes on. Okay, So the higher order terms are going to be even more difficult to take the derivatives because you have products of four terms now. But the other thing that you should notice is what is the truncation error? The truncation error originally in the function it was of order h to the power m. But every term on the right hand side is divided by h which is of order h m minus 1. So we say that the derivatives incur a greater error whenever you have numerical differentiation because when the order goes down, the error goes up. Okay, The order is high, the error is small. Why? Because typically we construct the problem in such a way that h is less than 1. Okay? h is less than 1, powers of h are going to be much smaller. Okay, So the higher power will be much smaller than a lower power. Okay? So this is a lower power, so the error in the numerical differentiation goes up in comparison to the function itself. Any questions on that? Okay. So now we have a formula for the derivative that we can evaluate to any order accuracy. How do I do that? By simply deciding where I truncate. So if I truncated the first term, I would get an uh, error of order h. Why? Because the neglected term is of order h square, so m equal to 2, and so 2 minus 1. Error truncation error will be of order 1. Okay. So m equal to 2, I am truncating it after two terms, but in principle I have only one term because the first term is 0. Okay. So this is going to be an approximation to f prime at the reference point x1. 
When the reference point is x1, what is alpha? Zero. Alpha is zero. Right? When x is x1, alpha is zero. That's what I'm saying here. At x1, alpha is equal to zero. So I'm trying to find an approximation for this by taking only the first term, delta f1. And so I have a truncation error of order h. Why? Because m is equal to 2. Okay. The polynomial that I have started is m equal to 2. Okay. So if you put m equal to 2 here, 2 minus 1 is 1. So the truncation error in this derivative approximation is of order h. And now I can expand this one. So this is going to be equal to what is delta f1 by definition? You remember that from last lecture? f2 minus f1. It's a forward difference, right? So delta f1 is the difference between the point ahead and the point, uh, the current point. That is our first formula for the, a derivative, the first order derivative of a function of a tabulated data. What does it mean geometrically? It simply means the, that we are taking this function f and x. There are two points, f1 and f2 at x1 and x2. I'm calculating the difference as f1 minus f2. Right? That is the vertical height. Right? F2 minus F1 is the vertical height and H is the horizontal height, distance. Okay? So this is the slope, the slope by taking two points. So it's just a different way of deriving. This you would have said from your high school algebra course. If, you, if I say, if I give you these two points and say calculate the slope or the first derivative, this is one of the simplest formula that you can think of. Okay? Uh, but what you wouldn't have known at that stage would be that the error involved in that formula would be of order h. So the smaller the h, the smaller the error. So if these two points are closer to each other, then you get a better estimate of the slope. If they're farther apart, you get a poorer estimate of the slope. But this is thought to be the slope at f1. That is, it could be treated as a slope at f2 or f1, but this is a forward difference formula. So the interpretation is, it is the derivative evaluated at x1. Okay. The same number, when you use a Newton backward formula, will appear as the derivative evaluated at f2, x2. That's a backward difference formula. Both are estimates for the slope. But one is an estimate for the slope at f1, the other one is an estimate for the slope at f2. Any questions? The nice thing about the Newton polynomial approach is, from uh, uh, high school algebra, this you could have done, but you couldn't do anything better. If I say do a second order accurate estimate of the derivative, how do I get the formula to be more and more accurate successively, we would be stuck. But now we have the tool. All we need to do is go back to the formula and say, okay, I'm going to take the first three terms. I'm going to put m equal to 3 and just expand that and see what I get for the, the same thing. Estimate for the first derivative at x1. But what do I need? and how accurate does the formula get, okay? How many of you feel you can do that at this stage now? If I say go and develop a first order, uh, I mean a first derivative approximation at x1 that is of second order accuracy. By second order accuracy, I mean the truncation error is of order h squared. The formula is there. This is something that you should be able to do in the final exam, okay? I would say, uh, in fact, I will show you a set of tables that I have. You should be able to derive every one of those formula in the table for the derivatives, first derivative, second derivative, etc. There are some that are more important, I will point out, but you should be able to handle any, any one of them. Okay. So if I'm going to take the second derivative, what do I need to do? I need to truncate, I mean the first derivative, second order accurate, I need to truncate there and I need to put still alpha equal to zero because I want the derivative still at x1. If I want the derivative at x2, what would I do? Then you will put alpha equal to 1 from the same formula. So that formula is pretty powerful. It allows you to derive a whole class of what are called difference approximations for derivatives. These are called finite difference approximations for uh, derivatives.
Okay, so let's do that. So the first term doesn't have any alpha. The second term has alpha, but I'm going to put alpha equal to zero. Okay, so I'll get minus one half. Here you can see minus one half times del square. Um, here. Okay, so it's a two-term expansion. Still for the first derivative at x1. So I still have one over h1 delta minus one half delta square operating on f of x1. But the truncation error is of order h squared. How did I know that? Because I took three terms in the series. Okay, so m is equal to three. Okay, but the first term happens to be zero. So I'm left with only two real non-zero terms. But from the polynomial approximation, it is um, three terms. That's a quadratic. With three three numbers, three data, you can fit a quadratic. So what I'm doing is in the first instance, I put a linear line between those two data points and use that to evaluate the slope. Now what I'm going to do is conceptually or geometrically, I'm going to take these points x1, x2, x3, f1, f2, f3, and I'm going to put a quadratic equation through that. And take the derivative of the quadratic equation at this point and evaluate the slope from that. And that's going to be a better estimate than just putting a straight line. Okay, So that's the idea. And of course, the formula is then delta operated on f1 okay, and then delta square operated on f1. How would I expand that? So I will have 1 over h times delta f1 is what? Do you remember? f2 minus f1 minus 1 half delta square f1 is this I don't expect you to remember but I expect you to be able to derive it. How would you derive it? If you don't remember it, how would you derive what is delta square f1? So the no, no, no. Bold attempt, bold attempt. But it's not squared at all. Delta square doesn't mean that it's a square. It's not an exponentiation. It's not a power. Delta square is the same as d square f dx square. What is, what is the meaning of that? I'm applying it twice. So this is the same as d dx of df dx. So in a similar way, a delta square f1 simply means delta of delta f1. Okay. Then we, this we did in the last class. Okay. So then we expand the inner one. Delta f1 we already know how to expand, which is f2 minus f1. And then take delta of operating on f2 and delta operating on f1. So delta operating on f2 will be what? Now we can try this one, right? It's going to be f3 minus Exactly, f3 minus f2 minus minus f2 minus or minus plus f1. That you should be able to do. In SAT, I'm sure we had exams like these, questions like this, right? Operation on operation within an operator, okay? So this should be f3 minus 2f2 plus f1. Okay, now you can simplify that and when you simplify this, you will get, uh, I'm running out of space, let me write this as f prime x1 as equal to uh, 1 over 2h multiplied by minus 3 f1 plus 4 f2. I'm not doing this mentally, I'm just copying it from my notes here, <laughs> plus of order h squared. Okay, so you need to simplify this. You need to regroup those terms. That's very easy. So I'll give it one shape. Two take the two as a common factor and simplify that. But the interpretation of the formula is important. So what this tells you is I can calculate the slope at this point x1 by using these three data points f1, f2, f3. So all of them appear there. So you need in your table at least three data points to be able to use this formula. But if you do that, you will get a more accurate estimate of the first derivative at x1. So if you compare this with the previous formula, you would be able to deduce that this is going to give you more accurate result. Okay. Suppose h is 0 0.01, the distance between x1 and x2 is 0 
So the error in the first estimate of the formula will be of order 0 0.01. What does that mean? It means you're going to get at most two digits accuracy, no more than that. Okay, if you use the first order formula. But if you use the second order formula, the H error is going to be of order h squared. So the distance is 0 0.01, the error is going to be 0 0.0001. So you will get at least three digits accuracy if you use this formula. If th that is assuming that there is no noise in the data, th this would be a more accurate formula than the previous one. Okay, any questions? Did I start recording? I guess I didn't. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Um, okay. Any questions on those? What does the absolute silence mean? <laughs> Easy going? All right. The next question then is, I use the same formula, but I calculate, as I said earlier, the derivative at x2, not at x1. Okay, so in this case, alpha must be 1. Okay, so I need to go back to the full formula that I derived for the derivative, for the first derivative, with a reference point at x1, but I'm evaluating the derivative not at x1, but at x2. You see here. How can I do that? What should I do in order to get an estimate of the first derivative? at a point other than the reference point that I have used to construct the polynomial. All I need to do is realize that x2 is equal to x1 plus h and alpha is equal to 1. So wherever I have alpha here, I substitute 1 instead of 0. And then once again, I have the choice of truncating it at any position I want, first term, second term, third term, etc. Okay? And you will get a whole class of formula for that. First derivative at a different location. Okay. So when you do this, um, what do you get for a two-term expansion? Okay, so you're going to get 1 over h. Help me out. That's why I guess you have it in the notes. <laughs> it's going to be delta operating on f1 plus 1 half delta square f1. So two-term expansion, we're just going to truncate there. Okay. So the next term that is left is delta q. So m is equal to 3. So the truncation error is of order m minus 1. So it's going to be h uh, squared. Now you need to once again expand this and simplify this. Okay, So it's going to be 1 over h, f2 minus f1 plus 1 half. What would this be? Delta square f1. If you remember the template from the last time, it's going to be f3 minus 2 f2 plus f1 plus truncation error of order h squared. Now you simplify that and that gives you this expression 1 over 2 h f3 minus f1. Okay, what is the geometrical interpretation for this? We have three points. This is x1, x2, x3. That's the curve that I have put. Where am I calculating the derivative now? At the middle point. Okay, so I'm estimating this derivative to the accuracy of order h squared. But it uses points on either side. It actually doesn't need the data at f2, but it needs the data at f3 and f1. So this is called a central difference approximation. Okay, so the previous ones were called forward difference approximations because they were using points ahead. So this is a central difference approximation for the first derivative at x2. It uses the points 3 and 1. Okay, So it's nice uh, symmetric about the point that we, where we are evaluating the derivative. And it happens to be one of the important uh, approximations for solving differential equations that we will see later on. Okay, So this is uh, three point, it's called a three-point formula but it needs, because it needs three data points and it's called a central difference formula. Okay. So, so far we have derived as an example, and there are many, many other things that you can derive. Three, three formula. One is the two-point forward difference approximation, uses forward and the current point. It's a first-order approximation at x1, but has a truncation error of order h. 
It's very rarely used because it's, it has a large error. Then we have a three-point forward difference formula for the first derivative at x1. And that uses three data points ahead of it, one, two, and three. And it's a good formula because it has a truncation error of order h squared. What do you think would happen, if you understand what we have been talking about, if I try to develop a, a first order derivative approximation at x1 that is of order h cube? Can you speculate? Well, how would that formula look like? What would be the data points that it would need, it would use? A first order formula used 1 and 2. A second order formula used 1, 2, and 3. A third order formula would use 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you need more and more data points because you're trying to fit a higher degree polynomial. So you need four data points to fit a cubic and then take its derivative. Okay, so you normally abandon this idea after a while because you want to get the right order of error and the right number of points. You don't want too many points because you may not have too many points all the time. Okay, so this is one of the important equations that we will use. Okay, and the other one is this one, the central difference. A first order approximation, a central difference at x2, but it uses f1 and f3. It has a truncation error of order h squared. Okay, any questions on that? No? Okay. We are going to extend the idea to higher derivatives. Why? Because we have differential equations that we want to solve. We are preparing ourselves not only for functional approximation, but to be able to solve differential equations using method of finite differences. These are all called finite difference approximations. So a differential equation may, may have a third derivative, a second derivative, first derivative, etc. So we take each one of those derivatives and replace them with their approximations, these difference approximations. And then we'll convert a differential equation into a set of algebraic equations. Then of course chapter 2, chapter 1, what we have seen about matrix inverse will be useful. That's how we, one of the ways of solving differential equations. Okay, So we are preparing ourselves for that. So we need to then de develop approximations for the square, the second derivative of f at x1. So we're using basically the chain rule approximation. So it's d d alpha of df dx, so d alpha dx. Okay, And inside that I expand once again, replace f by the polynomial. So it is dpm alpha d alpha. This I have already figured out in the previous step. All I need to do is take whatever I have in the previous step, plug it in there. Then take the derivative one more time with respect to alpha. Do you understand that particular step, what I've indicated there? Everybody? If so, you tell me what would be the first term that I would get instead of 1 over h, what would I get? d alpha dx is 1 over h, but I have that appearing twice. d alpha dx, 1 over h squared multiplied by something. But what does it do to the truncation error? So, uh, decreases by one order of h. One, it decreases it by one order of h. So it will become of order h to the power m minus 2. Okay, If I take m terms in this and plug it in there, the neglected term would be of order h to the power m minus 2. Okay, so I have taken care of this d alpha dx, which is what my 1 over h square is. I have taken care of what the truncation error is. Now I need to go and look at the previous formula I had and take its derivative one more time. Okay, and what is that formula? I guess I need to switch back and forth here. Let me see. The formula I am talking about is this one. Whatever you see in here, that is the first derivative of the polynomial with respect to alpha once. Now I need to take the derivative of this term with respect to alpha again and then plug it in there. So what happens to the first term? It doesn't have alpha in it, so it is 0. Okay, And it, if you think about it, in the series, all the subsequent terms are going to be smaller in magnitude. That's the reason why we say we can neglect the truncation error. So the most dominant term is the first term. We lost the first term when you take the first derivative. We lose the first two terms when you take the second derivative. So the first derivative already is, has more error than the function. The second derivative will have even more error than the first derivative, which has more error than the function. 
Okay, that's that's what we see in the order of the error going down from h to the power m minus 1 to m minus 2, etc. So the first term is going to be 0. The second term is going to be, uh, no, there is no product fortunately, so it's just going to be 1 plus 1, which is 2 or 2 factorial delta square. Okay, so let me just keep these in mind and write them. So the first term is going to be 0 and the second term is 1 plus 1 divided by 2 factorial delta square. Okay, and then I need to go and look at the next term. This is going to be really messy because I need to take, now there are three terms and each one is a product of two. So when I take the derivative, it's going to be alpha plus alpha minus 1, alpha plus alpha minus 2 plus alpha plus alpha minus 2. Okay. Chain, we basically chain rule applied on this particular term that operates on delta q. Okay. So, I'm not sure whether I can write all of them there. <laughs> so, if I make a mistake, correct me, okay? I might make a mistake deliberately to see whether you catch me. So that's the first term, alpha times alpha minus 1, take the derivative, then alpha minus 1 times alpha minus 2, plus what would be the last one? Alpha and alpha minus 2, right? So it's going to be alpha plus alpha minus 2, divided by 3 factorial, delta cube f1. Oops, what happened? Okay, and that has a truncation error of order h to the power m minus 2 plus higher order terms. Okay, and now you can choose to evaluate this second derivative. This is an approximation for the second derivative at any point. So if you choose alpha equals 0, I'm evaluating the second derivative at x1. Okay, so I'm evaluating the second derivative which is this term, I'm evaluating it at x1, which is this term, and so that means I'm going to substitute for alpha 0 everywhere in that series. And when I do that, I get this series with a truncation error of order h minus 2. Now I decide to truncate at any particular term, okay? So after truncating at one term, for example, you will get delta square f1. So this will have a truncation error of order 1. Because m is equal to 3, I'm taking three terms, but the first two terms turned out to be 0. I'm really taking only one term effectively, okay? But it is coming from a polynomial uh, with m equal to 3, okay? So three, three data points. You can see the three data points here, f1 to f2 and f3. So it has a truncation error of order h, which is lower than what we had previously for a three-point formula. Okay. So this is the approximation for the second derivative at x1. It is, what would you call it? Forward, central, backward. The, the, in these terminologies, you would call this as a forward difference formula because it uses three points ahead of it. And this is essentially expansion of del square of 1. Okay. So this is called a three-point first order accurate approximation for the second derivative. I, I hope you get the idea. You can continue to play this game forever. I have shown you one more. If I take the two terms, after two terms, so the first term and the second term, and do the expansion, you will get a four-point formula, f1, f2, f3, f4, which will have a truncation error of order h squared. Okay? This will have a truncation error of order h squared. So of these two formula for the second derivative at the same point, the second formula will be more accurate if you have four data points. Okay. And uh, I'm going to kind of move forward because I think it's getting repetitious, right? The same idea, the same formula that you have for the second derivative, but I'm evaluating at alpha equal to 1. What does that mean? Uh, yes, you are looking ahead already. I'm going to evaluate it at x2, okay? Because alpha is 1, I'm evaluating the derivative of x2. And the beautiful thing about this particular formula is the two, of the two terms that I take, the second term, when I evaluate this, becomes zero. Okay, so the truncation error is of order h squared. And 
it requires points f1, f2, and f3 only. And this is a derivative at x2. So it's called a central difference approximation. Central difference means I'm calculating the derivative at one location, and I'm using points on either side. So it's centrally located. Okay. The forward difference would mean I'm evaluating the derivative at that point using points ahead of it. The backward difference would be the opposite. Okay. So here is the table. This table again, you don't have to remember anything in here. It will be in the formula sheet, but I might ask you to say, go and derive this for me. Okay, you should be able to do that. You should be able to derive that particular formula and show that the truncation of evidence of order h square. Okay, and the more important use of this table would be when we are solving differential equation, and we will do that within a week or so. Um, you should be able to select the right formula from this table to have the truncation errors matched in a differential equation. For example, just, just let me talk about it right now. If I have a differential equation d square u dx square plus 5 du dx plus 10 u equal to 0. I want to solve this. And it's a boundary value problem. Okay? So I tell you that u at plus or minus 1 is equal to 0. Okay? So what you need to do is look at the second derivative and which formula would I be able to replace that, approximate that with. For example, you can look at the second derivative, uh, this one, at xi, it uses i plus 1, i minus 1, i. It's a central difference approximation that has a truncation error of order h square. So you replace that term with that formula. And then similarly, you look at the first derivative. And you look at the first derivative and see which one has truncation error of order h square. Because all the terms should have the same truncation error. Okay? And which one would you pick? For example, this one. Why? Because it is also central difference. It uses the same points, i plus 1, i minus 1. Okay? And then, of course, u itself would be, there is no approximation there because it's not a derivative. So you, you'll replace u by ui. So you will get an algebraic equation from that that is equivalent to this differential equation. So you convert dif solving differential equations into solving algebraic equations. This method is called the method of finite differences. We will see examples of these later on. I'm just showing you the motivation for why we spend a lot of time deriving these finite difference approximations and worrying about what the truncation errors are because we want to match them. Okay? Any questions? The next assignment I will have on this chapter, okay, functional approximations uh, using MATLAB by hand using these tables, calculating derivatives, integrals, etc. Um, there is another way of deriving these equations. If you don't, if you find the Newton polynomials to be complicated, another way is using Taylor series expansion. Okay? And I've just illustrated here for two of those formula, but you can do this for all of them using just the Taylor series. So if I have a Taylor series expansion for f of x i plus h, how would I write the Taylor series expansion? It would simply be f of x i, that is the reference point, whatever the reference point i turns out to be, plus df dx at i times h plus d square f dx square at i times h square over 2 factorial plus d cube f dx cube at i, the reference point, h cube over 3 factorial plus etc. It just goes on. That's a Taylor series approximation for a function at a reference point x i and you can use that to calculate the function at any other location h away from the reference point. Okay? This is like shifting it by alpha h if you like. Here h is just a step, one step ahead. Okay? And similarly, when you write it at the point behind the reference point, it's the same Taylor series. All it is going to happen is wherever you have the odd terms, the sign would be minus. So you'll have f of x i minus f prime of i h plus f double prime. I'm just indicating the second derivative by double prime h square over 2 factorial minus f triple prime h cube over 3 factorial plus it just goes on fourth derivative h to the power 4 over 4 factorial minus etc. So you take these two Taylor series formula and add and subtract them in such a way that 
you cancel a lot of these terms. For example, if I subtract fi plus 1, this one is nothing but fi plus 1 because it is calculated at xi plus h, which is the next point. And this one is nothing but fi minus 1 because it is calculated behind that. So fi plus 1 minus fi minus 1 would be simply, this is a, this is b, so that's going to be simply a minus b, term by term. Okay. When you do that, what you will notice is that the first term cancels out. The second term becomes what? When you subtract, it will become 2 because you have, now the minus sign becomes plus, right? So it will be 2h times f prime i plus, what happens to the third term? H square term. It will cancel out. Why? Because you have plus and plus. We are subtracting that. Okay. Here we have plus and minus. So when you subtract, it becomes 2hfi. So what will be the next term that is not 0? Am I going fast? It will be this term. Because the minus is going to become plus, so you will have plus 2 times h cube times f triple prime divided by 6, uh, six 3 factorial. Okay, So that series will continue on. But what I want from the series is an approximation for the first derivative at i. So what I do is I focus my attention on this particular term and move everything else to the other side. So I have separated that f prime and that is equal to f i plus 1 minus f i minus 1 divided by 2 h. So I divide everything by 2 h and I divide this term also by 2 h. <coughs> so the h cube becomes of order h squared. <coughs> That's a term that I'm neglecting in the Taylor series. Okay? So this becomes a central difference approximation for the first derivative that is an error of order h squared. A formula that we already derived in the table before, if you see, <coughs> excuse me, this is fi prime, which is fi plus 1 minus fi minus 1. And that is this formula. It has a truncation error of h squared. You derive that from Newton polynomial, but you can also derive the same thing from Taylor series expansion. <coughs> and if you take the same two Taylor series terms, and add them instead of subtracting. So when you add them, the ones with the opposite signs will cancel out. But this will become 2 fi. This will cancel out. This will become 2 h squared. The next one will cancel out. And then rearrange that for the second derivative because the first derivative gets cancelled out in that case. So the second derivative at i, this formula becomes fi plus 1 minus 2 fi plus fi minus 1. So that's just another formula that we derived before that has a truncation error of order h squared. As I said, these are the two important central difference approximations that we will use later on. <coughs> Both are called central difference. The first one is for first derivative. The second one is for a higher derivative, a second derivative. Any questions? That's all about numerical differentiation. Okay. <coughs> Do you need examples for these things? I, I can make up an example here. How many of you feel at this stage that you understood something about it or you didn't understand anything? An example would be helpful. Example would be helpful. <coughs> okay, let's let's just make up an example. <coughs> Do you understand what is numerical differentiation? Why we need it? Can anybody kind of articulate that back to me? What are numerical derivatives? If somebody asks you the question after this lecture. You say, can you explain to me what numerical derivatives are? What did you learn in that one hour of lecture? What would you say? No? <laughs> I think we are not doing very well then. <laughs> um, okay.
Okay, let me give you a, a set of tables. Okay, x i f i. I'm just making these up. <clears throat> so I'm going to pick some nice numbers. Okay, h is one. Normally h would be smaller than one, but I'm just going to make up some numbers. So f is going to be coming from um, x squared, for example. <clears throat> so it's one, four, nine, and sixteen. Okay, so you can plot that, f versus x, so this is 1, that is 1, I have a data point there, and then 4, 9, 16, so it's a parabola, okay. <coughs> now, from a chemical engineering point of view, from a practical point of view, where do you find application for this? This would be, uh, as I said in the last class, you're doing experiments and you're measuring the concentration as a function of time. Your independent variable here turns out to be time, this turns out to be concentration. And the data is coming from some experiment or from some observation in a plant. Okay? And you want to see how fast the concentration is changing. Okay? Um, another example, in the uh, oil spill, for example, you're monitoring the oil uh, spreading at a particular location. And you have a con uh, the oil concentration as a function of time. And you want to predict how fast it is decreasing. How long will it be before the concentration goes to zero? So when you have data coming from physical observations in tabular form, and you are interested in answering questions like, how fast the particular variable that I'm monitoring is changing? Okay. Either from point to point or from with respect to time. Okay. One would be a distributed kind of model. The other one would be a dynamic kind of a model. So in those situations, you will need to take the derivative to estimate how fast. Another example would be administration of some kind of a insulin or a uh, medicine. Okay, and you want to see how fast it is absorbing into the body. So you inject the insulin and you monitor what is happening in the liver or some other place. You get concentration as a function of time. Okay, so in all these cases, if you are interested in questions like how fast, the rate, the derivative. Okay. So you have only tabular data and you need to take the derivative of those tabular data. These methods that we have seen so far allow you to do that. Okay. So think of this as some such data coming from some physical experiments. X is your independent variable, F is your dependent variable. And I ask you on a piece of paper, go and calculate F <coughs> prime at 2 to accuracy of order H or to accuracy of order h squared. Two tasks. How would you do that? Yeah. You could use a forward difference approximation. So your reference point would be this. <coughs> right? And you're trying to calculate. Basically what you're saying is, I'm going to take these two points and put a straight line through that and evaluate the derivative, the first derivative at that point. So the answer to the first question would be f prime at 2 would be, <coughs> let, let's label these as f1, f2, f3, f4. Okay, so I label these as i, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The subscript i is 1, 2, 3, or 4. The actual value of x turns out to be 1, 2, 3, or 4 as well. The function turns out to be 1, 4, 9, and 16. So if I'm saying calculate 2 of order h, the first derivative at 2, what you are going to do is take this as f. You tell me. In terms of those symbols, what would the formula be? A forward difference formula would be, as you said, f3 minus f2 divided by h. So you would substitute the numbers 9 minus 4 divided by 1, which is going to be 5. But it will have a truncation error of order 1. <coughs> this is a poor choice of h, I said as I'm making this up. Okay? But if I say calculate 1 of order h square, your suggestion was I would use the central difference. What would be the central difference for f prime at 2? Central difference would involve f3 minus f1 divided by 2h. Okay, So you would now 
substitute F3, would it be 9 minus 1 divided by 2H, which is going to be 8 divided by 2, which is going to be 4. Now this is going to be of order H squared. If I now ask you the question, which one of those numbers would you trust more? What would be your answer? The second one. Okay, because it has a truncation error of order h square, so this would be more accurate than that one. Okay. <clears throat> now, if I say estimate the first derivative with a second order formula at x equal to 1, so what I'm asking you to do is f prime at 1, but I want this to be of order h square. What are your choices? <clears throat> Because you are at the edge of the data set, you cannot use a central one because central one would require a point four. One person is following the whole thing. Oh, all of you are doing that. Right? So you need at least a three point forward difference formula. Three point will give you a quadratic curve, right? That will give you a order h square. Now you need to all, all you need to do is go back and look in the table, <coughs> and you'll be able to see which table would be which formula would be the best. <clears throat> so you're looking at of order h square for the first derivative at a reference point i, but that will involve i plus 1, i plus 2. i, i plus 1, i plus 2. So it's a three-point forward formula. Okay. Now we are focusing on what the problem is and how we get it solved, not worrying about where these formulas came from. Okay. <clears throat> so what would that be? That would be, uh, wait, I guess I forgot the formula, minus 3 plus 4 minus 1, okay. So minus 3F1 plus 4F2 minus F3 divided by 2H, but that has a truncation error of order H square. <coughs> okay, now you can plug in the numbers, okay. Let me just erase this to make some space. So it's going to be minus 3 times 1 plus 4 times 4 minus 9 divided by 2. You can figure that out. Okay. So that's going to be a second order, first, or, first derivative approximation at 1. If I do the same thing, I say find me a first derivative approximation at 4, the second order accurate. Three step backwards. Now you're getting it, right? So you go there and look for one. Which one is it? <clears throat> it is this one. Why? Because it has i, i minus 1, i minus 2. Current point and the two points behind. Okay? <clears throat> so you would use that, the current point and the two points behind these. Plug into that formula. So it gives you a variety of options for evaluating first derivative, second derivative, and of course this can be extended. There are third derivative formulas as well, okay, using forward, central, backward, difference approximations. <coughs> Is that any better? All right. Any, any questions? Okay. So the next topic is numerical integration, the opposite of differentiation. So we've spent a lot of time understanding how these equations are derived and how they can be used. Okay. <coughs> so the next question is, what is numerical integration? Just like we asked the question, what is numerical differentiation? Derivative is an analytical concept. It's a concept of limit going to zero, how fast a particular function is changing. Okay. So Integration from an analytical point of view is the inverse of differentiation. Graphically, you give the me meaning that it is the area under the curve. So if I say, find me the integral of f of x from a to b, what I really mean from a geometrical point of view would be, I'm going to plot that function with respect to x between a and b, the limits a and b. And I'm asking you to find the area under the curve. Why is that the interpretation that it is the area under the curve? Because if I take a thin slab, the height is my function, and delta x 
is my thickness. So the height times the thickness is that differential area. So when I can integrate that out, I'm just summing up all these differential areas. So the integral will be analytically the integral means you need to actually find the inverse of the differentiation. So you need to know the integration formulas and MATLAB has routines for symbolic integration as well. We'll get into MATLAB and show how these things are implemented in MATLAB. Okay. <clears throat> But numerical integration simply means find me a numerical value. I don't care about analytical expression for what the function is. This is a number between A and B. The integral of that is a number. Give me that numerical value of that integral. Okay. <clears throat> and when do we need that? We need that in two situations. One is when the function is so complicated that there is no analytical way to integrate that. Okay. It's not known. And uh, so it's true that not all functions can be integrated back. Okay, And so in such a case, we can always generate a table of data from that function. You can write a small MATLAB file for the function and evaluate the function at a set of data points. And then we have a table. Okay, Then we can find the area under that curve for the table. The second situation is we have a tabular data that is coming from some experiments, from some observations. Okay, <coughs> For example, the rate of release of uh, oil from uh, the BP fill is uh, 500 barrels a second or something like that. That's a rate, okay? And that rate keeps changing. For this month, it is one rate. For next month, it is a different rate on day to day. And I have that data. I give you the data. And then I ask you to calculate what is the total amount of oil that is released, okay? So I give you the rate of release and multiply it by delta T. That's going to give you the amount of release. But that amount released, the rate released is changing with time. Okay, So that function is given to you. So it is basically integrating or summing it up or adding all the discrete elements. So that's the basic idea for numerical integration. So as I said, I have a function f of x and I'm plotting it here. And I'm interested between the limits a to b. Okay. So numerically what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that interval of x into uh, from i equal to 0. I'm labeling this as 0. And I'm labeling this as n. I'm dividing this into n intervals. Okay. So I'm labeling the interval as 1, 2, 3. So this is my subscript i, which indicates which point I'm talking about. So I have a table once again, xi, fi. But it goes in this particular case from 0 x0, f0, x1, f1, all the way up to xn, fn. And I want the area under that particular curve. So <clears throat> I'm sure you have seen this in uh, previous, uh, some, some of the courses, so-called trapezoidal rule. Okay? Trapezoidal rule, once again, is very simple to geometrically understand it, but it doesn't give you the ability to generate more accurate formula. If you just write down the trapezoidal rule and understand it, it's good, but if you understand it, how we can derive this from the neutron polynomials, it gives you the power to generate higher order, more accurate integration formulas like the Simpson's rule. But let's talk about the trapezoidal rule. What does it do? It simply takes these two points, F0 and F1. Okay. So what is the average of F0 and F1? Plus F1 divided by 2. That's the average, right? So I draw a horizontal line at the average point and then I multiply it by this distance delta x or h okay and that is the area that is the area for that particular strip it has been averaged out so whatever I chopped off from the top I have added to the bottom okay. so if, it, if the original curve were actually a straight line there is no error but if the original curve is a more complicated function, then there will be the error. So if I ask you the question, what is the error in trapezoidal rule? I don't know. I've derived the trapezoidal rule. This is the trapezoidal rule. Simply takes two neighboring points, takes the average, multiplies it by h, and I can do that between f1 and f2, between f2 and f3, and I can add them all up. So I will get the sum that I'm requiring, the area under the integral, but I will have no clue as to what the error is. Okay. So this kind of deriving it from the Newton polynomial gives me that additional information. What is the error? And we are going to introduce a concept of a local and global error. Okay. Any questions so far? What is integration, numerical integration, and how we are going to go about it? We are going to assume that you will always have a set of tabular data. 
even if I'm giving you a function, the first thing that you will do is generate the tabular set of data and then develop formulas that can use these numbers to give you that answer of what the integral is. So I'm defining my h, the spacing, the distance between two neighboring points as b minus a divided by m. That means I'm dividing this into n equal intervals, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., all the way. Okay. So the relationship between x and alpha as before is x0 plus alpha h. x0 is my reference point. I chose to start my numbering from 0. Okay. That is probably a poor choice because MATLAB doesn't have 0 as an index. <clears throat> and if that is the case, remember what I want is integral of f of x dx. But my new variable is going to be in terms of alpha as I indicated here. So I know the relationship between x and alpha. So what is dx? dx is for derivative of x0 is 0. So the derivative of alpha is d alpha. So h times d alpha. So I can take this and replace that dx by h times d alpha. Okay. <coughs> so I'm going to find the area under the curve for the first segment that I have indicated here between x0 and x1. And then I can just repeat that process, right? So what is the integral between x0 and x1 for a function f of x dx? It is approximated by the polynomial of degree 1. I put a p1. So it's a polynomial of degree 1. That means it is a straight line, okay, between those two data points. Now, when x equal to x0, what happens to alpha? Is 0. Okay, when x equal to x1, alpha is 1. So I'm making the transformation of the variables from dx that you see here to hd alpha. So I made the transformation for x into alpha. That is why I make the transformation for the limits also. Because my integration is done originally, it is given as an independent variable x. But I'm doing it with a new variable alpha. The reason for doing that is my polynomials are expressed in alpha. Okay, so I need to change the limits of integration uh, from x to alpha. That simplifies the problem because it's between zero and one. Can you explain what is happening here? <clears throat> exactly. So that is the truncation error. That is the error term that I have neglected, but I'm just keeping the integrals under the integral sign to see what happens to the error. Okay, so the original polynomial had an error of order h squared. Why? Because it was a linear polynomial. I took two terms. Okay, so the neglected term is of order h squared, but that also has to be integrated with h d alpha. So I have a multiplication by h. I really don't have the ability to evaluate that term. If I did, I would add it and I will have no error. Okay. So I have no ability to evaluate the term, but I'm just keeping this h as an indicator of what is the order of the error. So now the order of the error becomes h cube. Okay. This is why I said earlier, the error in integration always goes down. The order in increases. Okay. So the integration is more accurate always than differentiation. Now given a tabular data and say, take the derivatives of that, it's always susceptible to more error. That is, if you say integrate that, it's always better to do that because the integration has the pro pro process of smoothing out the errors, cancelling out the errors. Uh, maybe the another, another way of understanding this is if, why, why does that happen if you ask that question? I give you f versus x, but the data is coming from a very noisy environment, okay? Pressure signals from a pressure transducer. The data is like this, and you want the integral under the curve. But you're going to put a straight line through that. So sometimes you may have an area more, sometimes you'll have the area less. So this process is called smoothing. So a lot of noise in there and integration smooths it out. Whereas the derivative will take the two successive points and take the derivative. So it amplifies the noise, the error in the noise. So the integration is a better process than a differentiation. But you have no choice. Sometimes you have to take derivatives, sometimes you have to take integrals. But what you would, would you do if you see a lot of noisy data? is to smooth the noisy data by putting a low order polynomial through that and then take the derivative, okay? So if, if one term expansion from the Newton poly polynomial gives you one plus alpha delta, 
Previously, the one was lost by taking the derivative, but now that is the dominant term that remains. Okay, so times h of d alpha, and the error is of order h q. Now you work through the tedious process of taking the derivative. So h is a constant. You take that out, and you have f zero one time one operating on f zero simply f zero. So that f zero is there. But then you have d alpha. So integral of d alpha is alpha. Plus the second term is delta f zero. Remember, delta f zero is a number. It's a difference operation. Okay, so that you don't integrate with respect to that. You are integrating with respect to alpha. But then you have alpha d alpha, which is going to be alpha square over two. Okay, and the limits are between zero and one. <clears throat> and now you substitute. So there is one step, I guess, that I can write there, which is h times uh, alpha f zero plus alpha square over two f one minus f zero between zero and one. Okay. Now you substitute the limits, so it's going to be h times the upper limit is one, so f zero, uh, one half of f one plus f, sorry minus f zero, and the lower one is zero, so it drops out. Pardon me. So now you take the common factor, so you get h over two times f zero plus f one, with a truncation error of order h cube. Okay, so this process of using the Newton polynomial has allowed us to say something about the, tr the truncation error. So trapezoidal rule has a truncation error of order h cube, and it uses two data points, and it is exactly the same interpretation. F zero plus f one over two is your average height, and h is your average width. So that is the area for that particular strip the, between x zero and x one. And this is called a local truncation error. Question? Any questions? Why is it called a local truncation error? It is the error in that one step going from x0 to x1, finding the area under that data point x0 to x1. But we need to repeat that to kind of find the integral between a and b. How would I repeat that? I would just add them up. Okay, from A to B, I divided that into n strips. So I just put a summation sign going from 1 to n. It's an addition, simply an addition of all the formula going from xi minus 1 to xi, f of x dx. Okay, so that is summation from 1 to n of that trapezoidal rule formula that I had, h over 2 times fi minus 1 plus fi. All that says is take the current point, the point ahead, average it out, and then go on to the next strip and do the same thing and repeat that. Okay, but this is going to be summation of all the truncation errors. In every step, you're going to have a truncation error of order h cube. Okay, so what is if if all the errors were approximately of the same order of order h cube, then this term is nothing but of order h cube multiplied by m. Because this is the error per step, and there are n steps, so the total error is n times of order h cube. But what is n? n is the number of strips that we choose. Okay, so between b and a, we divide it into certain number of uh, strips. So that has one over h there. So when I substitute for that, this becomes of order h square, and that is called a global truncation error, accumulated truncation error. It's an important concept. We will see also this in solving differential equations later on. So the error per step is called the local truncation error. The global truncation error is the accumulated one over the entire interval. Okay, and the global truncation error is always one order lower than the local truncation error. The global truncation error is more because it's accumulated one. Okay, any questions on that? Now that we know how to develop the trapezoidal rule, not from geometrical interpretation, but from this procedure, algorithmic procedure using the Newton forward formula, I can systematically expand it. And that's what gives you the so-called Simpson's rule. Okay? Trapezoidal rule is a two-point rule, which needs only two neighboring points, and of course you apply that repeatedly. And the Simpson's rule is a three-point rule. It requires three data points, f1, f2, f3, or f0, f1, f2. Okay? So you take two strips at a time, 
and find the area under that using the three data points. Conceptually, what we are doing is we are putting a quadratic and finding the area under the quadratic. Okay. And mathematically, what we are doing is we are just integrating from x0 to f x2. So it goes from 0 to 2 in the alpha variable. And this is a polynomial of degree 2. H d alpha is u d x. And the truncation error is of order h cube h. So it is actually of order h to the power 4. Okay. I think we are running out of time. I don't want to rush this. Maybe we'll stop there and go through this carefully because there's a subtle point I want to illustrate with this particular formula.